Let us pray. For we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 7. My wonderful Father, I want you to know how much I adore you. You are more real to me than the floor beneath my feet or the chair I sit in. Your word says that without faith it is impossible to please God. It seems that faith is what blesses you more than anything else. When I trust you and believe in your goodness by faith, it puts a smile on your face. Everything I encounter or go through here on earth is designed to build my faith and strengthen me. I've been fed so many lies by this world and its fallen nature that it's a great undertaking to break me out of that worldly mentality. The people in this world are influenced by what they see. They live for what the world honors, wealth, fame, accolades, and success. But I walk by faith and believe in the glories of heaven where my Savior lives. I believe there is a crown of glory waiting as a reward for those who love you. Living by faith is to act as if these things were true. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. My natural eyes only see mortality, corruption, and misery. But by faith, I see another more excellent and glorious state, and I order my life according to my faith and those things that are invisible. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening to today's daily prayer. For more inspiration and an incredible message from our feature pastor, stay tuned to Pray.com's Sunday service. Welcome to Pray.com's Sunday service, sponsored by Altrua HealthShare. Follow this podcast and listen weekly to receive godly wisdom and practical advice for daily living. Stay tuned for Sunday service, coming up after a quick word from our sponsors. There's an innovative, better way to find health care. We're Altrua HealthShare, an affordable and flexible way to take care of your family. We're a community of like-minded, health-conscious individuals who share in each other's medical needs. And you can customize your health care your way with Altrua HealthShare. You can build your membership based on your season of life and your family's needs. Head to myshare.org to find out more. That's myshare.org. Altrua HealthShare, where we care for one another. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. What are some things that you want to keep the same about yourself or your life in 2024? Where are you already crushing it? Think opposite of New Year, New You. Around New Year's, we get obsessed with how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on what we're already doing right. Maybe you finally organized one part of your space and you want to tackle another. Or maybe you're taking supplements every morning and now you want to actually eat breakfast too. Therapy helps you find your strengths so that you can ditch the extreme resolutions and make changes that really stick. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress you've made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Sunday Service today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Sunday Service. Hello, this is Matt Potter from Pray.com, and I want to tell you about this new juice cleanse I've tried from Squeeze.com. As someone who's always on the lookout for healthy ways to enhance my daily life, I must say this juice cleanse has been nothing short of rejuvenating. While drinking the juices provided by Squeeze.com, I felt less bloated and had a noticeable increase in my energy levels throughout the day. This cleanse has been a game changer. Juice cleanses can range from one day cleanse to a seven day cleanse. Each bottle is labeled with a number of one to five. The number corresponds to the order to drink your juice. It's super easy. You also get a bottle of cashew milk to provide the body with protein, amino acids, and just the right amount of added substance to ease into the cleanse while keeping your cravings minimal. You will also get free and fast delivery with our promo code. Head to squeeze.com and enter the code SUNDAY for free same-day local delivery or fast free delivery nationwide. 
The podcast Bible in a Year with Jack Graham is a moving and inspiring audio experience that will help you master biblical wisdom. In each episode, you'll reignite your love for Scripture while learning to apply foundational truths to everyday life. This podcast was created to help you solidify your faith as you experience the story of the Bible through live action recordings and emotional orchestral music. Each cinematic episode is a journey through the Bible's most profound stories that will strengthen your appreciation of the Word and inspire you to keep learning. This is Pray.com's Bible in a Year with me, Pastor Jack Ray. Let's begin. Listen to Pray.com's Bible in a Year with Jack Graham on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcast. Hello, I'm Bishop T.D. Jakes, and I want to welcome you to my new podcast with Pray.com called Sleep Songs. Close your eyes and focus on God. Picture Him as your shepherd that knows you and surrender to Him. Each episode guides you on a serene exploration of Psalms, tranquilly calming every nerve and restless, mind-turning adventure that keeps you up in the middle of the night, transposing you into the safety of his arms. He is going to lay you down in green pastures and restore your soul. Join me and let the Lord be your shepherd tonight. Listen to Sleep Songs with Bishop T.D. Jakes on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. I'm in Psalm chapter 88, Psalm 88. We began a series that is, quite frankly, a very difficult series. Um, it brought up some memories in my past, some of the struggles in my own life. And there's no way I can answer all the questions. It's very similar to our Holy Sexuality message series that we did early in the year. There's no way I can answer all the questions in one. And in retrospect, as I look back in what I've prepared, I've realized that I've approached this kind of from back to front. This is the type of message I would usually deliver at the end of a series. I've decided to put it up front because I want this, this message to couch or to be the foundation for everything we say after this, but, make, but rest assured, we will cover these issues. Before we get into Psalm 88, I want to say something specifically to the next generation, because they are suffering immensely from what we, has been termed mental illness of various sorts. So we're asking why, doctors, physicians are asking why, medical centers are asking why, this seems to be a pandemic right now. There seems to be a pandemic of anxiety, of depression, even bipolarism and beyond. Because mental illness comes in different phases, different effects, and different degrees. But can I say something, first of all? I, I want you to know, as the younger generation, pep rallies will never sustain you. Now, you know, you've heard me define pep rallies. It's the raw, raw part of your faith. And there's nothing wrong with the raw, raw part. The raw, raw part's good. It can lift your spirits. As long as you understand that they are temporary fixes, they never cure, ultimately, the disease. I know most of this next generation, because of the entertainment industry, are drawn to these type of things. And if you find an entertaining, uh, inspiring, captivating speaker, I'm drawn to them as well. There's nothing wrong with them now. Please don't misunderstand. I like to hear a passionate, extraordinary, on-fire type of speaker. But that will not sustain you over the long haul, alone. You need information. You need truth. You need something that's going to internally transform you, not just make you feel a certain spiritual high in the moment. My son has a friend that says, I'll tell you the kind of preacher I like. I like the kind of preacher that really gets me going. And that's good. So do I. Everyone does. But sooner or later, you've got to move off the milk and get into the meat. The Hebrew writer says exactly that. This applies specifically to a series that we're doing on mental illness. Most of you, if you know my story, I have a history of anxiety disorder. In fact, preparing for this series, I found to be somewhat of a kickstarter again, to start the fire, a trigger. I remember, and I reflected back in the three and a half years, there was a period I could not leave my house. 
I was shamed, ashamed because I disappointed my kids. We'd be out in public and I was about to take them to dinner and a movie and suddenly I'd look at my wife and I'd say, you got to take me home. Why, Dad? Why? And I couldn't explain it. I felt like I was in a tunnel. I felt like the world, the roof, the sky was falling, which made no sense at all. And then there was the overwhelming sense of shame that a pastor who's supposed to be spiritually well put together would suffer this kind of mental illness. Can I tell you that when I suffered the most, I was at home and could not leave home. And I read all the time, and two sources. I read my Bible all the time, which turned out to be better than I ever thought it could be. And second, I read everything I could about mental illness. I think I have read thousands upon thousands of articles by doctors in journals, in medical journals, by Mayo Clinic, Vanderbilt Hospital, on and on it goes. And let me tell you, I could cite all those, but let me tell you what I've learned in the first part of this series. Number one, The medical world simply does not know what causes mental illness. They have theories. They do not know. The second thing I can tell you with certainty is only Jesus can heal you. Only Jesus can heal you. You say, what about medicine? I'm a fan of medicine to a degree because it masks the symptoms. You think, well, why would you want to mask something? Because when you are suffering from mental disability, you need something to stop the wheels from turning so that you can start to think logically and practically and put things into your life that will ultimately defeat the disease, not just treat the symptoms. Medicine can help you function, but medicine, as long as you know, will never ultimately heal you. When I was ill, people would come up to me and say things, suck it up, Pastor Jeff, you can do it. You know, you got Jesus in you. Just try harder. Trust Jesus more. You can do it. You can overcome. When the outlook is bad, try the uplook. You know, the victory is in you. It's already there. All of that is true. God has a plan for your life. All of that is true. I get that. But what people don't understand is when you're in mental illness, you're not processing properly. You're not thinking properly. And all these things are true, but they're just band-aids. They're still treating the symptoms rather than the disease. I just sat in my doctor's office two weeks ago because I've had to switch doctors because we've switched care providers. And my doctor wanted to talk to me about my history. And he noticed I was on Zoloft. And he said, tell me a little bit about this. And we talked for like an hour. I've never had a doctor spend that much time with me. I don't know if he was intrigued by me or if he knew I was the pastor of one and all and just wanted some time. Who knows? But I can tell you, I sat across the desk from this guy who's been in his a specific practice for over 45 years, well-respected. And he looked at me and simply said, we don't know what causes mental illness. We just know how to treat it. And by treat it, he means we can control the symptoms, not cure the disease. Now, I'm not anti-medicine. In fact, I'm a fan of modern medicine. I want to be careful here, but I'm not a doctor. I'm not a fan of the modern uh, modern pharmaceutical companies and their greed. I'm not a a fan of that to get all Americans hooked on some kind of medication to solve everything. Got a problem, take a pill. I'm not a fan of that. But that doesn't mean that all medicine is bad. James Simpson, the discoverer of chloroform, was a dedicated follower of Jesus and couldn't stand to see women who were having babies be in such pain. James Simpson, chloroform. Jonas Salk, who created a vaccine for polio, saved many, many lives. But here's what you need to know in this first message. Mental illness is real. You can't just speak it away. We know that it is related somehow to past trauma, but not all the time to past trauma. But it's not the past trauma that causes mental illness. We're now learning that it's your response to past trauma because everybody has trauma of some sort. There's not a soul on this earth that's not carrying some burden. So how you respond to it has a lot to do with the chemical makeup of serotonin levels in your head, in your brain. There is a physical impact from a spiritual life. There's no doubt about that. We're going to talk about that later in the series. Medicine and counseling are good things. But here's the thing. Mental illness, and we're not going to like this, is the pathway to greatness. Mental illness is the pathway to greatness, even though it's going to be the darkest season of your life. Now, I, I want to take you to, yes, I said that, the darkest season of your life. I want to take you to Psalm 88. Here is a psalm. I want to read the words to you first. He says, the writer, Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. Verse 2, may my prayer come before you. Turn your ear to my cry. You have put me in the lowest pit. In the darkest depths. Verse 7, 
Your wrath lies heavy on me. You've overwhelmed me with all your waves. Verse 8, you have taken me from my closest friends, and you have made me repulsive to them. I am confined and cannot escape. My eyes are dim with grief. I call you, Lord, every day. I spread out my hands to you. Do you show wonders to the dead? Do do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness in destruction? Are your wonders known in the place of darkness or your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? From my youth, I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and have been despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long, they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me my friend and neighbor. Darkness is my closest friend. I believe, and I'm going to show you as this develops, we are reading the song of someone who had suffered mental illness, most probably depression, from the time of their youth. Why do I believe that? I will unveil that as we go. But first of all, this is a psalm. And prayers in the psalm, with the exception of two, now there's hundreds of psalms, with the exception of two psalms, all the psalms start in despair and end with hope, except for two. Psalm 39 and Psalm 88. Psalm 39 ends by the writer saying, God, turn your face away from me in this last moment of my life so I can have at least one moment of peace before I die. And Psalm 88 ends with one Hebrew word. You can't see it in the English, but there's one Hebrew word, and the meaning is this. Darkness, that's my real friend. Now the question is, why did God put this psalm in the Bible? Why is it here? Well, as well as Psalm 39. I want to tell you why. And in those four reasons, I'm going to tell you to write them down. I believe we discover something that is priceless. Number one, here's why God put it in. To show you that mental illness can last for a long time. Lord, you are the God who saves me. Day and night I cry out to you. And then he says he's losing all of his friends. He's facing death. So whatever he's facing is pretty debilitating. And he's angry at God. He says, God, if I'm dead, I can't praise your name. Do the dead praise your name? Can I be righteous if I'm incapacitated like this? And then he says in verse 15, from my youth I've suffered and been close to death. So he suffered this from a very young age, most of his life. He's outwardly afflicted. But worse yet, he feels inwardly abandoned. See, this is the point. If you feel outwardly afflicted, but you feel that God is close and with you, you can do it. But he says, darkness is the only thing by my side. And that's the trouble with mental... You you can face outer darkness if inwardly you're experiencing his love. But when you're in these positions... You don't feel, whether it's objectively true or not, is not the point. You don't feel the closeness of God, which means this. You can be trying and praying and attending church and reading scripture and doing all the right things, and you can still feel darkness for a long time. Is that depressing? Yes, but it's also encouraging, and here's why. Because as a young student of the Bible, the thing that impressed me most about the Psalms was honesty. Because it's real. Do you remember that great movie, Princess Bride, and the great line where he says, life is pain, highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. The Bible is real Christianity. It's not trying to sell you something. It's realistic. It tells you that pep rallies and motivational speeches just won't do it. By somebody telling you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, it's not going to heal you. And sometimes the reality is, Life is about extended times of darkness, even when you're doing things right. And I remain truly concerned by some of the voices that the next generation is attracted to. It's almost like now that you're a Christian, they're being told nothing bad can happen. Christ is in you and you will rise above and there's no darkness that will ever come upon you. You're righteous and because Christ is in you, he's righteous. Therefore, God sees you as righteous. There will be no more darkness. And I always like to remind them, oh yeah, so you've heard of Jesus, pretty good guy, right? He's pretty righteous. They killed him. The point is, Jesus was clear in John 16, 33, that in this world we have trouble. And not just physical, but mental and spiritual battles. And the reason I labor this point is half the pain in our lives comes from false expectations. 
Job's friends, do you know the story of Job? Do you remember what their answer was to his suffering? They basically said, Job, you've obviously sinned against God. God is getting you. You deserve this. And Job's response finally was, you guys are a bunch of windbags. You're, you're not helping me. And then Eliphaz the Temanite comes and says, an, an amazing passage, Eliphaz the Temanite, who should know better, comes to Job and says, there's a spirit that glided past my face and the hair on my head stood on end. It stopped, but I couldn't tell what it was. A form stood before my very eyes and I heard a hushed voice. Can a mortal man be more righteous than God? And what? How does that help Job? I remember when my mentor came to my alma mater. And so I had my mentor and my favorite theology professor in conversation and they shared a similar story. And I think I've shared this before, just quickly. Uh, when you're in seminary and you take a final exam, you take essays or you write pages and pages. So you're given five questions at the end of the year exam and you get to choose three. And each question will probably take 10 written pages, handwritten pages to answer the question in full. And so if you haven't studied, most students will participate in what is called padding. In other words, they know they don't know any of the answers to the question. So they'll just write, 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 and write 10 pages of nothingness just so hoping that somewhere along all this fluff, they will hint at the truth and they'll get some credit for the exam. And both my mentor and both my theology professor said that one time a student turned in a paper like that and my theology professor wrote on the front of the paper, this is not right, this is not even wrong. I like that. This is not right, this is not even wrong. What you've written doesn't even rise to the integrity of error because you've simply said nothing. It makes no sense. That's what happens often when we're experiencing something that our friends do not understand, they mean well, but what they say makes no sense and gives no encouragement and doesn't do anything for the healing. It might put a Band-Aid on the symptom, but the disease is far, far deep. So I go back to the question, why does God put this in the Bible? Why does God put a Psalm, Psalm 88 in the Bible, where there, there seems to be no hope? First, to show you that mental illness can last a long time. Second, to show you the grace of God. Some of the man's prayer in Psalm 88 is not really a prayer, but an interrogation. Look at the sarcasm again in verse 10 and 11. Do you show your wonders to the dead? Do their spirits rise up and praise you? Is your love declared in the grave, your faithfulness and destruction? In other words, he says, how can I tell the world about all your wonders if I'm dead? I want to do so much for you, God. I want to spread the joy of your name. How can I do that? How can I declare your name if I'm D-E-A-D -E dead? Maybe not physically dead, but spiritually and mentally decapitated. The head, the thinking has been taken off of my spiritual and physical life. And I can't process things the way I want to process, which means I can't declare your glories. And then verse 15 again, he says, I've experienced this from my youth. He says, basically, God, you've never been with me. All of my life I've suffered. And you look at it and you think, that seems disrespectful, doesn't it? It almost seems blasphemous. Because this man is interpreting all of his life through his present circumstances. And he ends the, the psalm by saying, even darkness is a better friend to me than you, God, because at least darkness never leaves me. Notice the sarcasm. Remember I said that Psalm 39 also ends this way when the writer says, turn your face away from me so that I can have a little peace before I die. One commentator says this about Psalm 88 and Psalm 39. The very presence of these prayers in Scripture is a witness to God's understanding. God knows how men speak when they're desperate. Now you think about that. God placed these psalms here. God does not say, you know, there's no way I'm going to let this song or psalm make it into psalms. I don't want people to think they can talk to me this way. But God doesn't say that. He says, put it in. Because he identifies with those prayers. God is saying, I love this man, even though he's not getting it right, I fully understand his depression. Even though he can't see the whole picture, I see his frustration, and therefore, I'm going to extend my grace and mercy. God says to those who experience mental illness, and this is not just theory to me. This is real, because this is the case in my own life. God says to us in the midst of this, that I am your God, not because you get up every day and put on a happy face, not because you say and do everything right, not because you never talk back, not because you never lash out or get frustrated with me. I am your God because I love you and I am a God of grace. And we should find that liberating. 
That as we go through this series, all the things we're about to learn, we should never forget that. So why did God place it in the Bible? To show you that mental illness can last a long time. Two, to show you the grace of God during the dark seasons of your days. And three, to show you that mental illness is where you become a person of righteousness. This is hard to fathom. It's hard to accept. And when somebody told me this in the middle of it, I didn't appreciate hearing it. But in retrospect, after the fact, it's true. God put this here to show you that mental illness is where you become a person of greatness. This, the writer of Psalm 88, which again, we're going to unveil just in a moment. He should not be saying things he's saying, but at least he's saying them to God. You know, one day when I was in the middle of my anxiety, I finally got the courage to leave the house. I had to come to the office because I was preaching again that weekend. Through that season, I continued to preach and continued to pray and continued to learn. One day I got to the office and I just, my brain, it was in that cloud again. It was in that, that place. I don't know where you go. It's like Paul, whether you're in the body or out of the body, I don't know. The only difference was I wasn't caught up in the third heaven. I felt like I was caught up in the third hell. This was terrible. And I couldn't think, I couldn't process. You know what I did? I'm going to make a confession. I got my iPad out and I watched Forrest Gump. I don't know why. I just thought maybe I need a good laugh. The problem with Forrest Gump, you get some laughs, but you also get some serious dialogue. And I came to the scene where Lieutenant Dan, who had lost both his legs in battle, who hated Forrest because Forrest got the Medal of Honor and he felt Forrest was an idiot. And here Lieutenant Dan, coming from a long series of family members who were war heroes, got nothing. Lost both his legs. Forrest carried him out of the jungle. And Lieutenant Dan hated him for it. But not only that, he hated himself. Became addicted to sex, drugs, alcohol. He was destroying his life. But he heard that Forrest Gump has a boat and is shrimping in Alabama. And he promised Forrest that if you ever own your own boat, I'm going to come and be your first mate. Holding true to his word, he comes, he becomes the first mate, Forrest Gump, shrimping entity. But they're not, they're not catching any shrimp. And one day a horrible storm comes. And all the boats come in except one. And the only reason Forrest Gump remained is because Lieutenant Dan determined. He was determined to die that day. So he climbs on top of the mast with this storm that had the potential to destroy them. That destroyed every boat that had gone into harbor. And Lieutenant Dan has it out with God. And in his frustration, he says to God, you'll never sink this boat. Is that all you got, God, you son of a gun? Is that all you have? You call this a storm? And he yells, it's time for a showdown between you and me, God, one-on-one. -on -one. Here I am, come get me. You'll never sink this boat. And he screams and yells at God. And then in the next scene after the storm subsides, here comes Lieutenant Dan, the atheist, who's been shouting at God all night long. And Forrest says, he never said so, but I think he made his peace with God. When I saw that, believe it or not, God uses, if God can use a donkey, he can use Forrest Gump. I remember on my couch thinking, I got to get this out. And I let God have it. I'm a pastor. I'm your servant. I've been serving you since I was 21 years old. I have given everything to you. I went to Africa for you. I went to New Zealand for you. And here you are. You've got me in this darkness and you won't answer? The healing that took place that day, probably more than any medicine, at least I was still talking to God. And God did not strike me down and smite me because he's a God of grace and mercy. And I began to learn he was doing something. You know, what is, what is Satan's accusation against Job? Have you read the book of Job? Satan says to God, Job's relationship with you is transactional. Of course he serves you because you keep blessing him. Of course he does the right thing because you keep giving him more and more stuff. You withhold that stuff. You stop blessing him. You wound him internally and externally. He'll curse you. He'll curse the day he was born, and he'll curse you. Give him inner and outer darkness, and he will not serve you. That passage spoke to me because I realized that much of my relationship with God at that point in my life was transactional. 
that I had used people in the past as a means to my end, but now I'm using God. Did I really go to New Zealand and to Africa for God, or did I go for myself? Had I been serving him for me or for him? And you have to ask the same question. Is Satan right about us? About me? About you? We all begin with that attitude because we come to God to get something, and that's natural. We want to be healed. We want to be saved. Those are good things. But if you never grow out of that, emotionally you become a roller coaster because it'll be contingent on what you think God is doing for you at the present time. But God in our lives is trying to move us out of egocentrism where everything's about us into theocentrism that everything's about God. And Job speaks to God the same way that the writer of Psalm 88 speaks to God. Let me give you a demonstration. It's in Job 9, verse 22. It's all the same. That's why I say he, meaning God, destroys both the blameless and the wicked. You hear what he's saying? God, it doesn't do any good to be righteous. You kill us both. When a scourge brings sudden death, God mocks the despair of the innocent. You hear what he's saying? An innocent person dies, God, they're in despair. You do nothing about it. When a land falls into the hands of the wicked, he blindsfolds its judges. If it is not he, then who is it? Job is saying, you could have straightened this out. When injustice happens, you could have prevented it. You don't. Whose fault is it then? It's got to be yours. Job talks to God the same exact way in Psalm 88, the author talks to God. And yet, here's the key now. In all of this, at the end of the book of Job, God says, Job has honored me throughout this entire endeavor. And God turns to Job's friends and says, you better ask Job to pray for you, otherwise I might smite you. Job. After all the things that Job had said to God, why would, he say, why would God say to, that Job had honored him? And the answer is this. Yeah, he's talking. You might even say he's talking trash. You might even say he's accusatory. But at least he's still talking to God. At least he's still communicating to God. He's angry with God. He's complaining to God. He's accusatory to God. And he's wrong in most of his assumptions. But at least he's still talking to God. Because he knows God's there. Even though he does not subjectively feel God, he knows God's objective presence is undeniable. And Job never walks away from God. He stays with God until the very end. And as a result, Satan is defeated. If while you are in your darkness, you can t- listen, please hear me now. You're thinking, oh man, I want, I want something. I know, you, I know what you want. You want stats, you want healing. You want me to give you a formula. Just stay with me. Those things we're going to talk about. But for now, please understand, if you continue to do good, you continue to go to church, you continue to feel you're getting nothing out of it. In the middle of this fog and haze and confusion, if you continue to go to church, to read the word, to surround yourself with friends. If you continue to do these things, what happens is it turns you into greatness. But if you run and you run, the disease grows more intense. It is meant to turn you from egocentrism into theocentrism, which inevitably produces endurance, stability, peace, and a centralized joy. At the end of the book, Lord of the Rings, the book, not the movie, Sam and his friend Frodo are headed up to the mountain of doom. And as they're headed up, Sam realizes his strength and energy is gone, are gone. And he's come to the end of himself and he's tempted in the book to crawl up in a little ball and just die. And yet the writer tells us, even as hope died in Sam or seemed to die, It was then turned into a new strength. And I quote, Sam's face grew stern as the will hardened in him, and he felt through all his limbs a thrill as if he was turning into some creature of stone and steel that neither despair or weariness nor endless barren miles could subdue. It is in the darkness that you will throw away the transactional approach to God and begin to know and serve God the way he's meant to be known and served. Pragmatically, can I show you how this works again? It was my friend, Dane Johnson, that came to me in this mental illness when I was frustrated with God and I had no understanding. And basically, I was panicking. And Dane came to me 
having gone through a season of depression himself, said this to me. Jeff, when you can pray to God, God keep me in this darkness until I have learned the lesson and become the man you want me to become. When you pray that, and you mean it, because in the beginning you're going to pray it, hoping it's the kind of the secret code, the key that will unlock all this and you'll be free. But when you pray it and you mean it, two things are going to happen. One, you're going to find that you love God for the sake of God. You've become theocentric. And two, that's when you'll be healed. It's almost like in the darkness God says, all right, here we are, Jeff. We're going to find out if you've been serving me. Or if you think I'm here to serve you. Right now, you're not getting much out of me. I know that. You've taken so many things for granted in the past. Will you resign and say, oh God, I get it. I'm going to serve you. And I want you to build in me the man or the woman that you need or want me to become. That's hard to hear when you're in the middle of it because there are many causes, which we're going to talk about later, but there's only one attitude that brings victory. The only, atti- the only victory, the only way that to, to get this victory that we're looking for is to totally yield the entire illness over to God and to say, God, do in me what you have to do in me. Be gentle. Do in me what you have to do in me to make me into the man or the woman of God that you desire for me to become. Do you know, when I went through the anxiety disorder, James 1 began to make a lot more sense to me. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. I used to look at that passage as, okay, if I, if I behave and I endure, then I'm going to get the crown of life. But what I think James says here. The one who perseveres is the one who gets eternal life. So God wants to make sure that we persevere. So to make sure that we persevere, our whole life becomes a training ground of endurance. Teaching us to endure so that God can make sure those he's called will receive the crown of life. That somehow we turn into some creature of stone and steel that neither despair or weariness nor endless barren miles can subdue. Okay, let's end. Why did God put this in the Bible? To show you that mental illness can last a long time. To show you that God gives his grace in the darkest days of your life. To show you that mental illness is where you become a person of greatness. There's no doubt in my mind. But here's where some of you probably wish we would have begun. To show you the darkness is neither objective nor permanent. Now let's talk about this. Do you know who wrote Psalm 88? The person who said, God, you're not there. This is permanent. The person who does not say, I don't feel you're there. No, he says, you're not there. He doesn't say, I feel that you've forsaken me. You have forsaken me. You've abandoned me since my youth. He believes that darkness is absolute, not relative, that darkness is eternal, not temporary, that it's objective, not subjective. But he was wrong. Now, who wrote Psalm 88? The answer is a man by the name of Heman. Not Haman in the Esther story. Heman, H-E-M-A-N. And you will find his name in 1 Chronicles 6. And you will discover that David put Heman in charge of writing worship music and songs in the house of the Lord. Now, remember, the Psalms are... One of the greatest works of literature in history. Both historians, Christian and secular, will admit that. And Heman wrote the Psalms that are recorded in the 40s, 40 through 49. In other words, Heman wrote some of the greatest literary works of art in history. Nobody questions that. Millions and millions and millions of people have read his works, his songs, his music. No author has had their works and artistic impressions read, contemplated, and discussed as much as those who wrote the Psalms. He 
demon's darkness turned him into a great artist. And I go back to the two Greek words in the New Testament for pain, philipsis and priasmos. Both words refer to pressure. And the image is to stomp on the grapes in the wine press, squeezing them until the good stuff comes out. God had to squeeze Heman to get the good stuff out to encourage and minister to millions of people. Millions. And it goes on through generation after generation. Do you think Heman would have seen the day when you and I would stand in this place and talk about his work? No. His suffering was not relative. It was not absolute. It was not eternal. His suffering was temporary, subjective, and definitely relatable. God was always there whether he felt like it or not. And through his suffering, he was turned into a great artist. If God is your Savior, you can know with certainty this darkness will birth the greatest light of your life. I know you don't want to hear that now. I definitely didn't want to hear it, and I wanted to smack people who said that. But I cannot deny the reality of what it does. When, when you discover through this series that there's light at the end of the tunnel, there is a way you can be healed. I, I am confident of it. When you discover that, on the other end of it, you're going, to be, you're going to be singing a different song. You're going to be saying, those days were the best days of my life because they did something in me that changed me for eternity. God has not abandoned you. He's always working. How can I know that, Pastor Jeff? In the end of Psalm 39, God turned your face away so that I can have a moment's peace. The end of Psalm 88, darkness. My best friend is darkness. But what does Matthew 27 say? From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's the point? The point is because Jesus suffered total darkness, objectively, you and I only get subjective darkness. Because he did suffer abandonment, you and I only feel like there are times when God has abandoned us. But the reality is, because Jesus experienced the objective wrath of God, he didn't just feel abandoned. He didn't just merely feel the wrath of God. He experienced objectively the wrath of God and, the, and, the, and abandonment from God. He's the only one that can truly say what the writer Heman says in Psalm 88, darkness was his only friend. The disciples left him, his own people left him, even his own father left him. Why? Jesus suffered the darkness and the abandonment our sin deserves. Jesus experienced the darkness as his only friend was darkness, so that in your darkness, Jesus becomes your true friend who's always there, who's always working, and who will never leave. In the garden, Jesus did not abandon his darkness. And if you think about it, in the garden, Jesus did not abandon us in the middle of his darkness. When the darkness came, he could have fallen. He could, he, he could flee. He could have left. He could have said, no, I'm not going to do this. So because Jesus in the garden did not abandon us in his darkness, what makes you think he will abandon you in yours? He's already proving that he is a friend that sticks closer than a brother, that he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. And do you remember that sarcastic question in Psalm 88? Do the dead rise and praise you? Do you know what the answer is? Yes, they do. Because Jesus rose again and praised the heart of the Father for his restoration and for the defeat of sin and death. And that's exactly what you and I can do if we trust him. We too will rise up in our darkness and praise him. If you run to him, keep running, keep running, you will praise him for the deepest, darkest moments of your life. You know, there was a lady that used to come, just quickly, there was a lady that used to come every Easter when we used to meet at the Felix Event Center. We used to gather all our campuses and meet up at APU. And I would see her every Easter. She would force her way to make it to the service. And I would say, how are you? Because she was, fa she was facing brain cancer. I mean, it, it was a horrible journey. Beautiful mother, beautiful daughters and husband, beautiful family. And every time I ask her that question, how you doing? How you feeling? Does it hurt? And she would always respond, nothing that the resurrection can't take care of. Nothing that the resurrection. But the promise of the resurrection is not only in the life to come, but it's here and now. That dead people that dead bones can rise again, can rise up, can be lifted up.
Michael Wilcock, in his commentary on Psalm 88, this darkness can happen to a believer. It does not mean that you're lost. The darkness can happen to someone who does not deserve it. It happened to Jesus. It doesn't mean that you've strayed. This darkness can happen to anyone at any time because only in the next world will such things be done away with unnecessary. This darkness can happen to anyone without knowing why, but rest assured, there is a purpose and eventually you'll know it. You'll know it. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Listen. This darkness stinks. No other way to paint it. And it's true, your friends don't understand it until they've experienced it. It's impossible to explain. But can I tell you, as we go through this series, you have to keep this in mind. God is with you. God has never abandoned you. He is doing a mighty work in you. You're going to become a person of greatness. Yes, that's true. You're going to become a person of greatness. You're going to move from egocentrism to theocentrism. Your life is going to be about God. It's going to move past a transactional relationship into one that is so real and felt. It's going to change the rest of your life. If you will run and keep running to God, even when you don't feel he's there. I have so much more to say. Keep coming. Keep listening. Father, I pray for all our family members right now that are going through some type of mental illness. It is a pandemic of epic proportions in this country and around the world. Help me to explain the reasons why from the word of God as we go through this series. Encourage those who are in the middle of it right now in this deep darkness. Encourage them, if nothing else, to remember they should speak to you what is in you, what not ought to be in them. To be honest with you, you're pretty big God. You can handle it. But to keep running to you, even if it's running to you in anger and frustration, and to remember that you will never leave them, that because you did not abandon us in your darkness, you will not abandon us in ours. Encourage us. And let us know there's a lot at the end of the tunnel for healing but it's only in Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. The podcast, The Bible in a Year with Jack Graham, is a moving and inspiring biblical audio experience that will help you master wisdom from the world's greatest book. In each episode, you'll learn to apply biblical principles to everyday life. Each cinematic episode is a journey through the Bible's most profound stories that will strengthen your appreciation of the word and inspire you to keep learning. Listen to The Bible in a Year with Jack Graham on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. It's a simple truth. No matter who you are, mental health challenges can affect you, and how you manage them can make all the difference. That's why everyone should have access to mental health support that meets them where they are and helps them get through. BetterHelp provides online therapy on your schedule. It's flexible, simple to use, and more affordable than in-person therapy. Connect with a licensed therapist selected just for you. Learn more at BetterHelp.com. That's BetterHelp.com. Hello, this is Matt Potter from Pray.com, and I want to tell you about this new juice cleanse I've tried from Squeeze.com. As someone who's always on the lookout for healthy ways to enhance my daily life, I must say this juice cleanse has been nothing short of rejuvenating. While drinking the juices provided by squeeze.com, I felt less bloated and had a noticeable increase in my energy levels throughout the day. This cleanse has been a game changer. Head to squeeze.com and enter the code SUNDAY for free same-day local delivery or fast free delivery nationwide. The podcast Bible in a Year with Jack Graham is a moving and inspiring audio experience that will help you master biblical wisdom. In each episode, you'll reignite your love for scripture while learning to apply foundational truths to everyday life. This podcast was created to help you solidify your faith as you experience the story of the Bible through live action recordings and emotional orchestral music. Listen to Pray.com's Bible in a Year with Jack Graham on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.